show your support. Like, share and subscribe. Hello, I am that British guy and welcome to the Raw After. Now in this series, I take a look at the Raw following a pay-per-view from days past. And in this video, I will be looking at the Raw After the pay-per-view In Your House 6 in February 1996. Now, just a quick recap. In that pay-per-view, Shawn Michaels faced Owen Hart for the number one contendership for the WWF title at WrestleMania 12. And in the main event, Bret Hart defended the WWF title against Diesel in a steel cage match. And obviously, Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart both won, went on to WrestleMania 12 and competed in the epic 60-minute Iron Man match which Shawn Michaels ultimately won. Also on that card, Razor Ramon faced the 1-2-3 Kid in a crybaby match, and this was basically payback for the fact that the 1-2-3 Kid cost Razor the Intercontinental title at the Royal Rumble pay-per-view the month before, and also the tensions within the Camp Cornette where the British Bulldog faced Yokozuna and basically everybody got their licks in on Yokozuna. Oh, also, quickly, I obviously skipped over that quite quickly, the end of the Brett versus Diesel match, that was the one where Undertaker came from under the ring, just as Diesel looked like he was going to escape the cage, and he dragged Diesel under the ring, allowing Brett to escape the cage, and Diesel came back out like he had seen death itself. So, let's see what happened the night after on Monday Night Raw. Now, Monday Night Raw opened with a quick recap package, and this was mainly focusing in on the main event, basically covering all those points that I've just made about The Undertaker appearing and dragging Diesel under the ring. But it goes a little bit further to explain the wise to do with that. The Undertaker was in a title match against Bret Hart at the Royal Rumble and Diesel cost him that title match and so this was just sort of payback for that really and that's what's thrown these two men together. After that quick recap we get our first match. It is an intercontinental title match between Razor Ramon and the champion Goldust who took that belt from him at the Royal Rumble thanks to the 1-2-3 Kid. Now at the very beginning of the match, uh, basically the end of Goldust's entrance, Marlena is on the steps trying to blow smoke in Razor Ramon's face. And the only reason we know that is because it is mentioned on commentary by Vince McMahon. Because it's so dark you can't see a thing. I don't even know if Razor Ramon could see. She kept tapping him on the arm and he kept looking over to her as if expecting something. Nothing happened and he kept sort of diverting his attention back over to Goldust. And she ended up blowing the smoke pretty much in his ear as far as I could see because it was so dark by the time she actually came to do it. Goldust then tried to get the jump on Razor Ramon and that failed miserably. And Razor just went completely mental on Goldust, beating him in the corner. He manages to rip the robe off of Goldust and pull the Intercontinental title belt off of him. And is just about to clock him round the back of the head when referee O'Hebna grabs the belt off of him. Instead of letting that carry on and the match ending in a disqualification, which is really weird. And I'm pretty sure I mentioned this in the last video I did of these of referees getting involved and preventing disqualifications. In fact that was another Gold Dust match where he tried to deliver Shattered Dreams and wasn't allowed to because the referee got in the way. I don't understand why referees stop these things happening when they're there to just call the match as they see it, not to interfere in it. it it's bizarre but there we go. Razor then completely goes ballistic on Goldust even more and for about three or four solid minutes is just throwing him around like a rag doll. Goldust doesn't get any offense in at all until the first ad break 
Razor goes for a Razor's Edge and that gets countered to him being thrown out over the top rope. Goldust then gets control of the match throughout the ad break, but really it's just rest hold after rest hold. There's the odd sort of punch and kick here and there and we get to an exchange of sleeper holds and that was weird to hear the crowd pop for a sleeper hold. Goldust manages to get one on Razor Ramon but it's not a very good one he's kind of standing around to the side of him Razor is able to throw him off and get him in a sleeper of his own and the crowd cheer massively for a sleeper hold just try and get a sleeper hold over now in 2018 <clears throat> no chance anyway Goldust manages to sort of fight out of that gets slammed to the mat a couple of times off of the top turnbuckle from a superplex and a back body drop and sort of bounce rolls himself out of the ring. Him and Marlena then just walk off. He takes the count out loss and obviously retains his title. This then leads to a promo by Razor Ramon. He immediately after the match says, Gold Dust, I don't want your title. So, what the hell was the point of the match we just watched? Basically, what he's trying to get across is the title isn't as important to him as just beating the hell out of Gold Dust. And he calls for Roddy Rowdy Piper, that's exactly what he says, as the new president of the WWF to basically set a match between him and Gold Dust. Anytime, anywhere, he just wants to fight him. He's not bothered at all about being the intercontinental title holder he just wants a fight now presumably this was where they were going with this but the actual match at wrestlemania 12 ended up being between gold dust and roddy piper razor sat out wrestlemania and shortly after his contract expired and then he and diesel ended up going to wcw so they were obviously i don't know whether at that point they knew that Razor wasn't going to feature at WrestleMania or whether they were trying to create some kind of three-way storyline between them but obviously they shifted gears quite quickly and made it between Piper and Goldust. Anyway, Razor's promo was very slow, very kind of rambling to be honest. At one point he mentioned that Piper's got six kids and Razor loves the little kiddies and he's got kids of his own and... Basically, he doesn't want his kids having to watch that, referencing Gold Dust, basically. You shouldn't have to watch that on TV. Okay, great. That's a reason to fight someone, I guess. It seemed very heelish for a face character. I know he was the bad guy, but he was clearly being portrayed as a face character at this point, and Gold Dust as this weird, freaky, sexually confused heel, even though he was just living his life how he wanted to, and Razor Ramon was basically calling him out for it. But hey, there you go, wrestling, I guess. After this match, we get the first of many announcements that The Undertaker will be in the main event against Native American Tatonka. Not just Tatonka, but Native American Tatonka. Vince McMahon is very, very insistent that you know he's a Native American. Apparently that's really, really important for some reason. We will hear that phrase for the rest of the night, especially during the match, and it's very annoying. We then cut to Doc Hendricks, who gives us another recap of In Your House 6. And this basically just covering the Shawn Michaels and Owen Hart storyline, as I explained at the beginning of this video. He then shifts over to the Troubles in Camp Cornet, and at that point, Vader comes out with Jim Cornet in tow. Now, Montoya and Horowitz are currently in the ring, and they are about, or they think they're about, to have a tag team match against the Body Donners. But Vader comes in and basically beats the hell out of both of them. The Body Donners don't even appear. There is no match. They don't cut any kind of promo afterwards. You don't get Jim Cornette basically telling Vince McMahon and Jerry Lawler at ringside why they're doing what they're doing. They basically come to the ring. Jim Cornette's cheering as Vader beats up Montoya and Horowitz for no reason. Gets a bit of heel heat and then they leave. That was it. 
After this, we get a video package on the Ultimate Warrior. Obviously, WrestleMania 12 was his big return, where he squashed Triple H in seconds, completely no-selling the pedigree. This basically just shows his achievements thus far in the WWF, mainly focusing on the win at WrestleMania 6, with a few other marquee matches, and obviously showing him with the Intercontinental title as well. It's just basically like watching a video package on Mojo Rawley before he got a bit more serious and heelish. But it's basically a shouty man running around with bright colours all over him. So yeah, basically Mojo Rawley to be honest. This then runs into a video advert for WrestleMania 12. There is some footage of WrestleMania 11 with Pamela Anderson and Lawrence Taylor. Basically saying that WrestleMania brings the stars out, which is quite apt because WrestleMania this year is going to be in California. And you can be there too. You can buy tickets on this number now. That just seems ludicrous to me that a month before WrestleMania is due to be held, you're still able to buy tickets? What? <laughs> That madness, to be honest. I, I can't believe that that was even possible even then. I know the the buy rates weren't great at the time for the WWF and they were going through a bit of a sticky patch, but a month before WrestleMania, the biggest show of the year for them and you could still buy tickets. That threw me, to be honest, but there we go. Next up, we have a singles match between Marty Jannetty and the Ringmaster he is obviously flanked by Ted DiBiase and comes out with his million dollar belt. It's really weird seeing Steve Austin as the Ringmaster now. It's so jarring. The match itself that he wrestles is so technical based with go behinds and takedowns and working limbs all the time. At one point Vince says that he knows all the holds but he also knows how to brawl and obviously we know that he does know how to brawl because we've all seen Stone Cold Steve Austin but in this match you would not know it he throws a few punches here and there but not really anything significant it's all takedown and leg locks and like chin locks and things like that and a few sort of suplexes and back suplexes here and there it's so weird to see him wrestle this kind of a match to be honest there's about three or four minutes of him just dominating Ginetti. Ginetti gets thrown out of the ring and makes a bit of a comeback for all of about a minute before he gets dominated again and looks like Ginetti is gonna get another bit of a comeback but ends up doing a, well, it's an attempted back body suplex and Ringmaster lands on his feet and just grabs Ginetti in the Million Dollar Dream. And after about a minute of that, Ginetti slumps down to a seated position and the ref rings the bell. That is it. What is quite interesting during this match though, right from his entrance and right up till the very end when the bell rings, Vince McMahon makes a hell of a lot of references to the ringmaster being and looking in his eyes stone cold. It's really, really bizarre. I don't know off the top of my head how much longer he played the ringmaster gimmick. They said at this point he was still undefeated. If I'm being honest, this period I'm a bit sketchy on, to be honest. So I don't know whether that was then a loss and that's sort of how he then became Stone Cold Steve Austin instead. If you're more the expert on this, please do let me know in the comments below. I would be very, very interested to find out. Or even just point me in the direction of narrowing down the time frame so that I can see this on the network myself, because I'm genuinely quite interested in that transition. Obviously, by the time we get to King of the Ring that year, he is Stone Cold and not the Ringmaster, and he wins the whole thing, and we get the Austin 316 promo. But yeah, it's just very odd seeing the Ringmaster being referred to as Stone Cold. Very, very bizarre. Speaking of bizarre, after this we get yet another video package for Mankind, and he basically says that on the eighth day God created mankind and look what the hell he created with my broken teeth that I've swallowed and my missing ear 
and this hidden mask and goes on and on about all of his atrocities. It's a really, really good character piece for anyone that is not aware of the Mankind character and Mick Foley himself. It tells you in that one video exactly who this deranged psychotic lunatic is. It's really, really well delivered. It looks like he's kind of in this prison cell, like an old school jail cell of like a castle dungeon with stone walls everywhere and like a concrete floor and he's just huddled in the corner in darkness. You don't even really get a good look at his mask, presumably to keep that hidden so that when he makes his big entrance that's a bit more of a shock for the audience. But it was really, really well done, really well shot well written and produced probably the best video package on the entire show considering they were trying to push tickets for wrestlemania and the event itself the fact that the debuting mankind was going to get the best video package seems a bit bizarre to be honest but it obviously worked out for him in the long run ted dibiase is back out now as he joins the native american remember tatonka He's not just Tatonka, he's a Native American Tatonka. And this is our main event against The Undertaker, who comes out with Paul Bearer and his urn. Now, throughout the beginning of this match, and quite a lot of the preceding matches as well, whenever The Undertaker is mentioned, Vince McMahon makes a point to say that wherever The Undertaker is, Diesel will not be far behind, and vice versa. And lo and behold, a few minutes into this match that sees The Undertaker dominating the Native American Tatonka, Diesel comes out with an axe. Basically after four minutes, Tatonka manages to hit a Samoan drop on The Undertaker and that lays him out for all of about 30 seconds. And in that time, Diesel comes out with an axe and drags a cameraman backstage. And then while Tatonka is again, basically just doing rest holds on The Undertaker, we get a split screen of Diesel smashing the Undertaker's casket with the axe. Every now and then when he gets into a bit of a sticky situation where he can't quite get the axe back out of the wood of the casket, that shot disappears and we just get a full shot of the match. And then it will cut back to split screen once he's gone back to smashing the casket to bits again. This happens for about four or five minutes, in which time the Undertaker gets back on top with a single choke slam which looked awkward as hell because he went down with it instead of doing it just from a standing position but it wasn't as swiftly done as when the big show used to do it before he just employed his punch he sort of fell sideways with it as well i don't know whether he was meant to do sort of a falling choke slam or whether he just sort of lost his footing but uh yeah, Tatonka was sort of in control, goes to pick The Undertaker up and he does his whole lifts the hand to the throat bit, stands up with Native American Tatonka, sorry I meant that the last time as well, honest, and then shifts from the left hand to the right hand, which looked really awkward, why didn't he just grab him with the right hand initially, I'm not sure, um, then yeah, delivers the awkward choke slam, picks him up for the tombstone pile driver and one, two, three, pins him. Then at the end of the match we see on the Titantron at the back a video replay of Diesel destroying the casket and that leads The Undertaker and Paul Bearer to swiftly exit the ringside to basically find Diesel and see what state the casket's in. The only problem is during that time of moving him into the correct position we get a Billionaire Ted sequence with Larry Flynn on the Billionaire News Network. Oh, God, this was painful. I mean, it was probably painful for people at the time when you had the proper context of the Monday Night Wars going backwards and forwards, and obviously at this point WCW getting ahead in the ratings. But, oh, my God. God, this was painful to watch. References to the Nacho Man and the Huckster and wrestling all the way through it and basically just dragging Ted Turner's name completely through the mud with absolutely no 
proof of anything. It's just basically Vince McMahon attacking verbally Ted Turner in five minutes, no less, five minute sequence of the worst thing you will probably ever see on the network, these sequences. They are so bad. And it just went on and on and on and on until we finally cut back to The Undertaker and Paul Bearer for all of 20 seconds. That was it. In which Paul Bearer said that you're going to pay for this, Diesel, and then that's it, the end of the show. Oh, man, what a horrible ending. And to be honest, what a limp, lacklustre episode of Raw. No wonder they weren't doing so well at this point. The writing for that episode was terrible. The match between Razor and Goldust was okay, but ended really, really badly. Surely it would have been better for Goldust to sort of pick up a sneaky win. Or why bother going through the whole match? Just let Razor deck Goldust with the belt at the beginning. Goldust wins via disqualification. And then just have Razor beat the hell out of Goldust for 5 to 10 minutes. The crowd still would have loved it. And then we got the awkward promo at the end of it, which... So he was just talking round and round in circles. And it turns out that we didn't even get the match that we thought we were going to get at that point. Obviously, hindsight's a wonderful thing. The other match between the Ringmaster and Marty Jannetty was so... Well, it was just so mid-card. There were clearly no stakes involved at all. There was mentionings of Marty Jannetty putting together the new Rockers stable, even though they were trying to pass him off as a credible singles competitor. So whatever the point of that ever was, I don't know. The ringmaster looked okay, I guess, but having Ted DiBiase out there was pointless. He impacted on the match in no way at all. Obviously, there was the tag match that we didn't even get. It was just Vader beating up two blokes. There was no explanation as to why he did that at all. He wasn't calling anyone out. He wasn't clearing them of the ring so that he could have his moment. He just came out and beat up two blokes. Pointless as anything. And then the main event was basically there just to drag out the Undertaker and Diesel feud. Which, okay, fine. But the match itself was so dull. And because we got the split screen bit, Tatanka's moment of being on top of The Undertaker, because we it was done in the split-screen segment, it was just rest holds for four minutes. It was so it must have been so boring for them to watch in the ring. At least watching it on the network, and obviously watching it at the time on TV, you had the opportunity to just watch Kevin Nash smash the hell out of a casket with an axe. But even that kept cutting away, because he had the difficulty with the axe getting stuck in the wood. And then, obviously, the god-awful Billionaire Ted segment that went on for far too long just to cut back to The Undertaker for all of 20 seconds. To be honest, the best bits about this episode of Raw were the video packages, explaining what happened at In Your House, building up slightly for WrestleMania 12, and Mankind. The one for The Ultimate Warrior didn't really do anything at all. It was just, hey, remember the Ultimate Warrior? Here he was doing some stuff. At least the Mankind one established something going forward for his character. The Ultimate Warrior one was just, this is what he did a few years ago with no kind of promise of he's coming soon. Who's he going to face for his first match back or coming back for WrestleMania, it was just, here's the Ultimate Warrior, he did some stuff once. And yeah, Raw back then was only an hour, and okay, an hour show now of NXT only has three matches, but it has three decent matches that actually go somewhere. Their segments outside of the ring, whether they be backstage or like a promo, sorry, in the ring, they try to tell some kind of a story. The only kind of story progression we really got was... The Undertaker being mad at Diesel because of the retaliation. Okay, that makes sense, taking that forward to WrestleMania 12. And the weird, confusing thing of Razor Ramon trying to call Goldust out for a match and making Roddy Rowdy Piper book the match as the president. But he just had a match against Goldust for the title anyway and immediately said he didn't even care about the title. So... Yeah, there we go. So there you have it. That was the Raw After In Your House 6. 
Certainly not as good as last month's instalment after the Royal Rumble 1999. Let's hope that next month's instalment is a bit better. Now I know that traditionally March is the month for WrestleMania, but the last few years that has been pushed into April. So April will be the month where I do a Raw after a WrestleMania. And going back through the calendar, there weren't really that many pay-per-views that weren't WrestleMania in the month of March. So, we are having to go back only 12 months to Fastlane 2017, the night after Kevin Owens loses his Universal title to Goldberg. So, let's find out on the next video what happened the Raw after Fastlane 2017. But until then, I have been that British guy and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.